Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. How's it going, Lance? It's going so well. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing well. It's Wednesday. It's another release day, Lance. And today we've got another episode in our series on the wrongful conviction of John Juca. Yeah, we took a little bit of a hiatus on this just because the way the court system works and the way everything always seems to uh, move along with John's case is there's a, a lot of uh, hurry up and wait. And I guess now we're coming to the point where we're going to be in the, the hurry up phase again. What do you think? Well, there was a hearing that our guest uh, speaks about in this episode that was supposed to be last week on uh, Thursday on July 17th, 2020, but he told us it's been moved to August 18th, 2020. So we'll see about that. So if that part comes up in the episode, well, it does come up. Um, Just know that that hearing uh, did not happen and will happen in August. But Lance, our guest is a great guy. He's He's an author. He is a journalist. His name is Ted Ham, and you might know him at Hammer Daily on Twitter. He's got a pretty good uh, social media following, and he is very active with writing about injustice. Yeah, especially John Juca's case. He's written about it a few times in the Independent. That's I N D Y P E N D E N T. And this guy's legit. He's the chair of journalism and new media studies at St. Joseph's College in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. And he's written about various topics, everything from Frederick Douglass to Bernie Sanders. And he's written some articles about John Juca that we cover. And uh, this case, by the way, we have done several episodes on it. So you may want to go back and listen to those to be fully refreshed with the case. We called it a wrongful conviction. John was convicted in 2005 of second-degree murder of Mark Fisher, who's a 19-year-old football player. And, you know, I think Mark Fisher's story really gets lost in in this story, at least in our coverage, which um, is not intentional. But obviously we've had connections to John Juca's family. It's a tragedy within a tragedy because Mark Fisher was murdered. There is someone serving a prison sentence for that. And then there's also John serving a prison sentence for that. And then to add to the frustration of this whole thing, we have the famous prosecutor, Anna Siga Nigalazzi, who has gone on to television courtroom fame, has a perfect record when it comes to convictions. And there's a whole lot of what we're calling... um. Backward looking decisions, which is a quote that was taken from the independent article called top court gives prosecutors green light to conceal evidence from defendants. This is uh, from Theodore Ham, from our guest, uh, and that was written on July 1st, 2019. And really, you get a whole sense of uh, this frustration in his voice when when he's talking about the court system and and why things are breaking down and why things just appear to be corrupt on the surface. That's right. So follow Ted on Twitter. There is a link in the show notes. And don't forget to listen to our show on Spotify. And Lance, we also do these live get vocal shows on Thursday night. They're live virtual shows, and we are doing one again tomorrow night. And Lance, we have a very special guest. We have a really special guest, like you said. It's Heather Bish, who is the sister of Molly Bish. Molly Bish went missing for a period of time, and then she was discovered just a couple of miles from the Bish home, uh, murdered. Her murder has remained unsolved and has been one of the most significant uh, cases in Massachusetts. And she joined us on our airwaves uh, a few months ago and really um, brought a level of emotion that we hadn't seen in a long, long time. She's stuck with us throughout the past few weeks. We were planning a live show in Worcester with her, but due to the pandemic, that's been postponed to an indefinite date hopefully we'll get something on the books hopefully next year because we can uh, we can bring the the bill that she's trying to pass to the table we can highlight the molly bish foundation but she graciously agreed to join us on our thursday night get vocal uh family time at 9 p.m eastern standard and uh you can watch that tim on twitter that's right youtube facebook but where can you interact Well, it's just Get Vocal is the best place to interact. And there is a link in the show notes. And there is an entire community of like-minded people who are on Get Vocal in the chat room. So usually on these Thursday nights, Lance, we have the conversation going, the one that we're um, holding. And then there's a separate conversation that is happening in the chat room. Sometimes it has to do with uh, what we're talking about, um, questions for the guests, things like that. 
oftentimes it's also just a social meeting for the folks who meet every Thursday night. Yeah, they talk about what they made for dinner. Then they uh, pop in uh, to contribute to our conversation that we have going on with the four screens. And there's also people like Jason Watts in the in the chat room. And he's a big proponent for missing people. He's been working on Brandon Lawson's case. But people start asking him in the chat room what's going on with Brandon's case, what's going on with this case. So there's a lot of productive activity that goes on in the chat rooms. Yeah, it's a great time. So join us this Thursday at 9 p.m., On Get Vocal, there's a link in the show notes. And in case you are not familiar with Molly Bish's case, please uh, take a listen to that episode from May of 2020. Molly was 16 years old when she disappeared working at a lifeguard in Warren, Massachusetts, and her remains were found three years later in Hamden County after what became the largest search in the state's history. That's from Wikipedia. And uh, so she disappeared June 27, 2000, and her body was recovered June 9, 2003. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. Follow Ted Ham on Twitter. Thank you very much. Welcome to the podcast, Ted Ham. How are you today, Ted? doing pretty well thanks and yourselves well, we're doing excellent uh thank you so much for joining us in this virtual setting uh it's been a little bit since we did anything on uh john juca's case and i really really think that you make for the perfect guest to come back into this uh with us so just want to you know tell you that we appreciate your work that you've done on it and we appreciate the time that you're taking out of your day to to speak about it right now my pleasure well, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Um, with, uh, what is your background? I see you're an author. I know you're a journalist. Sure. And I teach journalism and New York City history. Um, I'm on the faculty at St. Joseph's College in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. Um, and I've been there since uh, roughly t- 2012. And I've been covering Brooklyn for the last two decades, really, in different for different publications. Currently, I write... Uh, most frequently for the Independent, which that's where I've been writing a lot about the Juca case. Um, I also write for Jacobin, and I had a piece in the Intercept recently. Cover New York City politics and criminal justice; are, those are my two main areas of interest. What was it that first got you involved in that field? Um, well, I started a publication uh, with friends from Rutgers and my first wife uh, called the Brooklyn Rail, um, which is still around. And this we started it in. F- informally in the late 90s and formally as a print publication in 2000. And so we had some coverage of the Brooklyn. Um, we covered a lot of Brooklyn politics, covered the Brooklyn DA's office, had some pe- pieces by Christopher Ketchum, who's also written about the Juca case. Uh, he wrote about corruption in the DA's office in the under Joe Hines uh, with the Kung Fu judge, uh, the story of John Phillips and uh, Heinz's real, um, incessant um, prosecution and some would say persecution of of, of, of former competitor, former rival uh, Phillips. So um, my regret is that I was uh, not paying more attention to the criminal cases that were going on during the Heinz era um, in the early 2000s. Um, but uh, I've since been able to write about some of those cases, including Juga's case, uh, in the last few years. So they're not going not going anywhere. The, the cases still exist and there's many more um, potential exonerations to be had. And yeah, you've written several articles on John Juca's wrongful conviction. And uh, and it seems like you've you've spoken with Doreen uh, Quinn Giuliano, his mom, too. Sure. Yeah, she's great. Um, but most recently, you wrote an article about Anna Sigan Nicolazzi and rogue Brooklyn prosecutor could face uh, a day of reckoning. Yes. Um, well, so that uh, involves other cases um, that were right around the same time as Juca's case. So, as, uh, you know, J- Juca's case went to trial in September of 2005. And uh, in J- June, I guess May and June of 2005, she was she won a couple of convictions during that period that sort of set the stage for what uh, some of the some of the gamesmanship or dirty tricks, whatever, whichever you want to call it, uh, on display in the Juca 
trial. That's what, so that's what I wrote about. So there's two different cases. One of a defendant named D- Demetrius Williams, uh, who was uh, convicted as for his participation in a mur- alleged participation in a murder in Coney Island two years before. And then Jermaine Cox, who was um, convicted for his alleged participation in a murder uh, at Fulton, uh, Fulton Street Mall, which is in downtown Brooklyn, that uh, was also in 2003, but didn't go to trial until 2005. So all of that parallels Juca's case and just the timelines, because Juca's the, mur- the murder for which of Mark Fisher, for which Juca was convicted for, but that was in October of 2003. Uh, when you said gamesmanship, what exactly do you mean by this particular gamesmanship? Well, uh, one of the things that she's known for, and uh, Nicolazzi, and certainly she's not the only one, that when a prosecutor changes uh, his or her theory of a case uh, in summation, that's um, considered, uh, that often can lead to uh, the conviction being reversed because since the prosecutor goes last in summation, uh, you're leaving the jury with, you're sending them off with that, a new theory of the case that all suddenly ha- that hasn't been debated um, fully throughout the trial. And so she did that certainly in um, the, the Coney Island case of Demetrius Williams. In the opening statement, he had a bulge in his waistband that indicated he had a gun. Uh, didn't, I'm sorry, did not have uh, a bulge in his waistband. And then um, in the closing statement, he had a bulge in his waistband. Uh, which enhanced his role in the, uh, uh, significantly in the, the murder. And so she did that with uh, Juca's case. He, he, he wasn't there at the crime scene and in her um, opening statement. And at, at the uh, closing, he, he was um, at the crime scene. Uh, a big difference <laughs> in that case. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so that's gamesmanship. Some, you know, that's not always a grounds for reversing a conviction, but um, it just shows you that, you know, she's going to um, do whatever it takes to, to win the conviction. And she has the perfect track record that she frequently touts, 35 and out. How, did, how is that possible? If she, You said that she'll start off the opening statement with something uh, like John Juca was not at the uh, crime scene, and then she delivers the contradictory statement in her closing statement. How, what happened in the meantime? Well, uh, she um, once she brought in the, the 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 witness John Avito the, from Rikers, the jailhouse informant. He reversed two previous um, explanations that she had been giving throughout the op- uh, trial after the opening statement, and, and so the, now he's he's the one who placed uh, Juca at the scene. And, and as you know, the uh, originally. The case, the case, the first time it was overturned um, was because of Avito had recanted, uh, and um, it appeared that favors had, be done, had been done um, by uh, Nicolazzi help, to help Avito, and that led to uh, the case being overturned a few years ago, and only to see the um, highest court in New York, the Court of Appeals, then restore the conviction um, in a controversial ruling in, in July of. Um, is it July last year? I guess the time time seems so weird now because of the pandemic. Like, I know it could, could be thirty <laughs> years ago. I mean, yeah. could have been yesterday. Wow. So, how does that make you feel about the thirty five and zero record? Well, I think there's clearly a lot of games and tricks uh, that she she deployed, and you know the the problem with the court of appeals ruling that up, uh, restored the conviction in Juca's case was that they said that the uh, yes, there was misconduct, but it was not mater- material as the word they use um, in the courts, but it really means relevant um, in co- for lay people like ourselves. Um, and so they said, well, yes, he was playing some games there, but it's uh, there's the, the guilt. The evidence is so overwhelming that uh, the, we, the conviction must stand. Um, and of course, that's quite questionable. The things that they pointed to uh, in that ruling to say um you know, here's oh, here's why he's so guilty that it does it didn't, didn't matter that the prosecutor played dirty dirty tricks. Pardon the obvious question, but how has this been acceptable as long as it has been? I mean, that's, I mean, it's an obvious question, but it's also a, you know it's a a head scratcher as well. You know, there, I think there's just a lot of institutional pressure to 
maintain convictions. You know, I think I, I guess you could factor in that in New York, at least, there, it's quite if you're, a wrongful conviction leads to a, a large settlement, so there is a monetary incentive. But I think it's also just the integrity of the justice system um, that they, that the, the judges, so many of whom are former prosecutors, including the chief judge Janet DeFiori, was a Westchester prosecutor, um, Westchester County. And uh, that is, uh, you know, that, that, that they want to um, do whatever they can to 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 maintain convictions. It just seems like that's the, the bias of the courts to say things are not that evidence is not material or foul play is not material. Stat the, the lot a lot of things get overturned because they weren't pres- what they call preserved for appellate review, which is if basically if the defense attorney doesn't object to something that happens in the case, then they then they often can overlook it. It, it can't be reviewed uh, and so on. So there's just a lot of uh, hoops to have to, to, you have to jump through in order to make, um, to overturn a conviction. And um, they're pulling out everything they can to, to maintain Juca's conviction, it seems like, as the, what people who follow it closely would say. Well, it sounds like you just said uh, it, it, there's a lot of red tape to um, pull off uh, overturning a conviction, but it sounds like the effort that's going into maintaining it feels like just as much, uh, like feels just as exhausting. Well, you get these the appeals bureau. Um, each district attorney's office has an appeals bureau, and the person handling the appeals bureau, uh, this guy Jobloff, um, Kenneth Jobloff. In Brooklyn, he's been there for um, well into the Heinz era, two two decades or so. I don't know the exact uh, amount of years he's been there, but for quite a long time. And he basically just reflexively uh, defends any conviction the office um, has won. So they they they'll fight tooth and nail, except when their conviction review unit um, decides they want to exonerate somebody. So um, if you fight them, they they fight back. If they but if they decide that uh, they want to exonerate, then they do. And they've done that over two dozen times. But they've also fought when the courts uh, have, um, the, the higher courts have reversed convictions, they'll fight to try to maintain them as they did with Juca. That's, that is an issue. It's important now in Queens, where the Queens, new Queens DA, uh, Melinda Katz, has a conviction, she calls it the Conviction Integrity Unit, and the person running it, uh, well, not the person running it, but the, the she at the same time as she established that she retained the same appeals bureau team from uh, the previous the Richard Brown era, and so they fought for every conviction. And Queens is really has numerous um, flawed convictions, uh, and so you just have people who are sort of that's the their career has been to go to defend almost anything their their office does, um, often just w- using whatever argument they can come up with. Um, and so it's, it, they're really quite this question, you know, how much are they really pursuing justice or just simply um, trying to uh, hold on to what they've <laughs> their accomplishments of whatever. So however you want to phrase that. Isn't there some sort of oversight committee that could look into this and maybe. Uh... Well, that yeah, I mean, that's a good point uh, or question that um, the legislature a few years ago, state legislature in New York, pushed through a prosecutorial misconduct commission that and Cuomo signed off on it, um, signed it into law, but then it was challenged. And the challenge uh, succeeded in the court because uh, the way they had designed the commission was unconstitutional according to New York's constitu- state constitution uh, in terms of who would be on the commission. And so uh, for, since then, uh, that was it, when it was first passed, uh, people were saying this could become a national model. Um, it got swatted down and now I don't know, I haven't heard any talk of it being revived lately, although the, in order to do it, I, I think all they would really need to do is change the, um, the way the commission would be selected. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's not clear why that's stalled, um, but it's worth looking into. What is the way that the committee is selected that's unconstitutional currently? Well, it, 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 it's not current because the, the commission doesn't exist, but the way, the way it, it had been approved by the legislature was that multiple um, uh, the legislature legislature would pick some of the members. And I think the governor, as far as I, if I'm recalling correctly, the governor would pick some of the members and so on. 
Um, whereas I believe according to the state constitution, it's only the executive branch that would pick is allowed to do, um, select members of commissions like this one. So there is a pair, there is a, another commission for judges and it has something to keep in mind as well. You know, the judges are work closely with the DA's office and that's certainly the reputation of the judge, Danny Chun, who's handled Juca's recent appeals based on the Avito revelations that we talked about. And there's a current one uh, that Chun is at least scheduled to rule on next week, July, uh, next Thursday, the 16th. He, but that's, he's been, he keeps punting on his ruling on that motion in, by Juca's attorney, Mark Bedero, to try to um, hold a hearing on whether Nic- Nicolazzi uh, refused to disclose um, or, or de- deceived the defense by not disclosing the jailhouse, uh, another jailhouse informant or j- the testimony of another jailhouse uh, associate of Juca. Um, and so he's expected, he's, he's um, should rule on that by next Thursday, but l- most likely he'll just say, I, I need, uh, that's not going to happen I'm another 30 days, which is another 60 days or another 90 days. And there's no real oversight. So go, just uh, coming back to the commissions, there is a judicial conduct mis- uh, commi- misconduct, judicial misconduct commission that the prosecutor, prosecutorial misconduct commission was trying to emulate. Um, but that seems to be pretty ineffectual as a, a safeguard against judges who uh, abuse their powers or um, have convictions overturned and so on. Chun is a good example of someone who's totally unaccountable um, because he was never elected. The judges in New York are either elected or appointed. He happened to be appointed first by Giuliani, then he was reappointed by Bloomberg and then reappointed by de Blasio. Uh, so he never goes before the voters and he doesn't have anything to worry about. Uh, he handles a lot. He handles a lot of the high-profile cases in Brooklyn, particularly regarding police misconduct. The Akai Gurley, Peter Liang uh, case, the case of the two cops accused of initially accused of rape in Coney Island, and so on. Those all are handled by Chun, and um, his record, his track record, is is generally uh, favors the police. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I'm surprised. Um, I, I mean, are we completely hopeless in this battle against this injustice? Um, I mean, it needs more attention. I mean, you know, it's uh, there's obviously a lot of attention paid to criminal uh, justice related issues in the last six weeks. Um, and so we'll see moving forward. I mean, it's hard. There's so many layers of bureaucracy and safeguard or prevent things that prevent uh, judges from being, being held accountable, for example. I mean, obviously, prosecutors can be held accountable at the ballot box. Right now, I, I don't know of anyone challenging the Brooklyn DA Eric Gonzalez next year, but it is possible. But uh, the more attention that's paid to these issues, the better, for sure. I mean, that will bring up, that potentially will bring about change. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And we're seeing that a lot out there. So that's that's a great call. And yeah, we should keep pushing too. This is ridiculous. And uh, I want to take a minute here to invite anyone who uh, has their phone out or is in front of their computer to just Google Anna Siga Nicolazzi and just, just look at the first five headlines in articles written about her. Let me just read these real quick as an, as an exercise. Rogue Brooklyn prosecutor could soon face a day of reckoning and this is news this is news for the record these are the last five things written about her my article (laughs) yeah yes it is prosecutor a hid recording that could have cleared grid kid killer which is john juga court documents say uh number three brooklyn da's office ordered to stop concealing (laughs) hold on let me open it hold please this is also your article uh concealing key witness info Okay, that's, uh, and here's five from the Daily Beast, the false conviction of the district attorney turned reality star. Sorry, I'm all over the map when I get a little uh, upset about these things. Well, I mean, the, um, one of the Daily Beast articles by Hella Winston, that, that, that shows the deception that went on with the current um, uh, m- motion that's pending before Judge Chun that I Theory, you know, it, that should be decided by next Thursday, but probably won't be. But uh, so sh- there was a, that tape of that second jailhouse informant, th- coincidentally or not, uh, sh- at the same time as those other two cases I mentioned, 
um, in June of 25, uh, 2005 were being resolved uh, with convictions, uh, she was she interviewed a that that jailhouse informant, and there's a 35 minute or so tape that never re, never was turned over to the defense. That's the that's the that's the the issue, and in that um, tape, this other defendant Joseph Ingram told her that um, Juca never well, was certainly not at the crime scene, and that um, Antonio Russo, the other defendant, was the killer went back to Juca's, Juca's house, knocked on his door, um, and Juca, Juca wouldn't let him in. Um, and that's what uh, Russo had told um, Ingram uh, while they were at Rikers together. Um, and so that certainly could have helped um, Juca's defense uh, at the time of the trial. But one of the problems is that she put him on the witness, put Ingram on the witness list but did not, um, she did not call him and she also misidentified him and, and, and stated that in court as well. She, she referred to him as John Ingram, um, not Joseph Ingram. Um, and so even if defense wanted to pres- try to track him down, they would be looking for the wrong person. And that's a pretty common name, trying to look for someone named John Ingram, um, who's, or when he's, his name's actually Joseph Ingram. <laughs> so that's a pretty uh, uh, devious tactic for sure. So she had no obligation to call him to the stand? No. In fact, uh, Mark Bedereau, Juca's current defense attorney, refers to that as hiding, hiding the witness in plain sight. Um, so he's, he's there on the, on the, on the list, but um, that, and that sort of is a CYA um, uh, move by the prosecutor. But uh, because she never calls him, then there was no impetus for um, Sam Gregory who was Juca's trial defense attorney to uh, try to track down this person. Oh, I see. So it's not like that list was shared with the defense attorney. So he couldn't have. No, no, she, he gets, he gets a list, but, but they, they back then at least uh, the, the, the since changed uh, with the recent bail reform legislation was pa- passed last year. They, it was what was known as trial by ambush um, in New York. So you, you give them a witness list to the defense just a few days before the trial. Uh, that's how it worked in the past, at least. Um, and so if you get a list, I don't know how many, how many names are on that list, but um, you're not going to necessarily, you know, have time or if you don't know who the person is or, and, and, and Juke has never heard of the guy because it's, it's the wrong name uh, and so on. Um, then you're not going to track down that party. Yeah, that's that's pretty devious. I mean, this isn't just like a, a Freudian slip or like a typo with his name, but what, what was her reasoning behind it? Did she say that she just made a mistake? Yes. I, I mean, I, I don't... Um, I, I'd have to look at what she said in response when Bedereau brought this out. Um, she claims that she turned over the, the tape, but she doesn't really have any real... Um, evidence of that. And, um, Sam Gregory gave a sworn statement saying that he, he never received it. So, uh, you know, they, they'll say whatever they, <laughs> they, they want to say, but there's no real evidence that she had turned out, she had actually turned that over. Yeah. And it does seem pretty, uh, egregious that she would miss repeatedly misidentify someone. I'm sorry. I, I'm a little confused why she still has a job after something like that. It seems like a pretty significant mistake to make. Well, she's no longer in the office. I mean, she's no longer act- actually a prosecutor. She's just doing the reality show, and uh, she's, she appears with Dr. Oz talking about criminal cases as well as an authority because of her 35-0 and 0 track record, um, et cetera. So... Yes. Uh, I mean, so why she has a job doing that, why she's a, an authority. I mean, that's television doesn't have the same um, standards. I mean, so and you can say whatever you want until there's no repercussion for that. But none, I mean, these the motivations of people who are um, working on her, these cases, not to just um, undercut her career. It's it's because um, these deceptions put people away for and who in all likelihood are innocent in some of these cases certainly didn't receive a fair trial uh in some of these cases uh and so on yeah and so 
what was it 2005 when john was convicted and given uh, 25 to life right yeah so it's it's 15 years he sat behind bars you know i want to bring this effect back to him because while Anna Siga Nicolazzi is out there hanging out, gallivanting with Dr. Oz, uh, John Juke is sitting in Rikers Island. Sure. Well, no, upstate. I mean, right. He, he, he was at Rikers until he was his conviction. And then he's, he moved upstate. I think your, your reason you associate with Rikers is because after his conviction was overturned a few years ago, he was then held at Rikers until the, the Court of Appeals, the highest court, restored the conviction. So, yes, he has been moved around in various prisons upstate and uh, done some time at Rikers. Okay. And that, is he still there? Do you know? He's upstate now. now he's, he's upstate. upstate. But he's back upstate. Okay. Well, I, I guess my, my question really is how much longer does this have to go on? He's served 15 years already of a 25 to life term. That's bullshit to begin with. I mean, that, that's certainly a, a, a good question. And it's, you know, a lot of the stall tactics um, from the Brooklyn DA's office. I mean, it, it seems like they may just want to be dragging it out so they can just finally say, you know, here's a deal with time served that can be accepted. Um, and, you know, so they don't have to, they can tell the um, victim's family who certainly, uh, you know, they, they have a, obviously um, a stake in this case as well that they did what they could and you know that the, now it's john has served his time and it's time for him to be let out or whatever whatever may happen that, that just seems like um a plausible scenario i can't say for sure but um we'll see i mean so if this if the if the current um motion proceeds like the previous one chun will deny the hearing eventually even if there is a hearing will uh will deny the right uh the, the grounds for a new trial and then the the appellate division may likely again rule in john's favor and order a new trial and then it would be up to the court of appeals to restore or not or, or not restore the conviction again so there's still i mean in, there's still a couple of years more regardless of what happens uh if it happens next week um so it's going to drag out for a while. I'll be back with you in a couple of years if you if you want me to, if you'll have me. <laughs> Unfortunately, let's talk about this case. We'll sure have you back, hopefully to celebrate John's release and to dig into these other ones. Yeah, I mean it's the the, the Odyssey, and the same for uh, the other two cases I mentioned, Jermaine Cox and Demetrius Williams. And I don't know how many of the other um, I know of at least another one or more cases. Um, certainly being looked at closely by uh, defense attorneys of, of, of Nicolazzi. So we'll see. Do you think that Dr. Oz knows this stuff? Do you think that he, like, how do you sit there with somebody who you know has done this reprehensible act? <laughs> he probably doesn't know. I can't imagine. <laughs> I haven't uh, probed his the, the psyche of Dr. Yeah. Oz myself, but. If you say, if you have a TV publicist and they're saying that you have a 35 and 0 record, you know, that's all they really will hear, you know. Um, and she presents well. So obviously that's strong enough to give her um, her own show and so on. So uh, that TV people can be led in all kinds of different directions. That's really disgusting. I know that it's about ratings and I know the producers are putting together the shows, but you know, I, I mean, if these people like. This is like how many lives are affected by this? And it's, it's ratings. What it's ratings. It's really ratings. You can't figure out some other form of entertainment that would actually promote some sort of like justice. It's got to be this like rating ratings machine. And if it bleeds, it leads thing. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, the ID, I guess they probably got into it with her before, before you uncovered some of this stuff, Ted, and before more of this stuff had come out about Anna. I was, I'm, I'm certainly not the first one who's written about it. Um, as we've seen articles and you guys have done your, your work as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it really takes a, a full reversal of, you know, a full on reversal. I mean, if, even if that makes her record 34 and one, I mean, that's still something, um, it's not 35 and oh, yeah, no harm in, no harm in, in uh, admitting you were wrong or, uh, or you lost, you know, losing uh, builds character. So my grandfather told me once.
I don't know any greater story than the underdog story or the uh, fall from grace and then making a comeback story. So even if she did concede to this one, I mean, there's still a future there with, you know, making the comeback. And I think, uh, you know, if there is a ratings bonanza that can go along with that, maybe that should be pitched. But, you know, just give up a couple of these records like like 30, 35 and one or maybe 33 and three or yeah. something. All the bullshit ones. Yeah. Oh, OK. She would be uh, stabbing in the back. All of her um, people have gone to bat for her over the years in, in this case, at least, which is many people in the Brooklyn DA's office. Probably cost the uh, the state or the county a lot of money, too. Yeah, I would think so. Sure. I mean, that's a long story. I don't. <laughs> it has to, hap- has to happen first. So, right? so... You've uh, met Doreen Giuliano, uh, John's mother. What was it first like when you met her? Oh, um, we hit it off, and um, I went to visit uh, John when, when he was at Rikers uh, with Doreen. So, yeah, and so she keeps me regularly um, posted uh, on his case and also many other cases because she's quite um, connected to the uh, families of exo- exoneration um, f- that p- people who've already been exonerated or people who um, feel like there is a strong case to be made for their, their innocence of their, their family member and so on. Uh, so there's a large network that she's tapped into um, that I've um, been able to draw upon in different stories I've written as well. So, well, what's next for you? What are you, uh, what are you writing next? Uh, well, I have a book that just came out. So yeah, please <laughs> tell us about this. Yeah. Plug away. Bernie's Brooklyn. Uh, so a different, this is my New York city history um, and politics uh hat that I wear. Uh, and so this just came out with, um, OR books. Yeah. It's got a lot of great stuff about the, the, the era in which Bernie grew up in the forties and fifties, um, in Brooklyn, when Brooklyn was the, um, center of the new deal or center of the democratic party, um, in certainly in New York state. And it was also the largest, um, de- block of democratic votes in, in the country. Um, and so the, Bernie's uh, agenda that people were treating as um, pie in the sky um, really was largely enacted here in the city that he grew up in. So um, free college tuition, t- CUNY, did, uh, City University of New York didn't charge uh, tuition until the mid 1970s and so on. Uh, there were uh, large public works projects providing work jobs for working people. Um, there was rent control one of his uh, famil- the issues that he invoked the most on early on the campaign trail this time around uh, and so on. So all the stuff that he was talking about was, was already here. Um, and that's what, that's what the book is about. That's awesome. Yeah. That sounds fascinating. You're, and you're talking about Bernie Sanders. Exactly. Wow. Very fascinating. And I'll tell you what, once we read that book, we will uh, ask you to come on crawl space to talk about it. And I guarantee Tim has already ordered it. 